What's up, Hero Squad? It's Kronos, and we're diving headfirst into the ultimate showdown with What If Deku Had All for One Part 6 The Grand Finale. Buckle up, hit that like button, and prepare for a finale that'll blow your minds. Shout out to Hine, the mastermind behind this epic, What If, series. Chapter 27 The next morning, Muriel woke Izuku up before the agency officially opened and took him to a western style diner for breakfast. Izuku didn't complain despite the way his anxiety was tugging at his belly. Sitting at the clean table, surrounded by salarymen and students fueling up for another day of school, he was pretty certain that he hadn't been dragged out for something bad. If Mirio senpai had figured out who he really was, he'd talk to him in the agency surely so that he had backup. Fussing with his fork, he kept his eyes firmly on his plate of pancakes regardless. Yesterday had not been good. The fresh bruises that had caused their waitress to give him his breakfast on the house ate but it had been seeing those shadows again had kept him up for hours, afraid that they'd follow him to bed like before. As kind as Mirio had been, Izuku couldn't keep himself from flinching a little whenever he looked at the other boy. Aren't you hungry? Izuku glanced up and then looked away quickly, fiddling with his fork even faster. Ah, sorry. I'm a bit of a slow starter in the morning. He lied. Mirio didn't say anything. Risking another look, Izuka could tell from the tightness around the other boy's eyes that he didn't believe a word that came out of Izuka's mouth. Izuka bit the inside of his cheek. Sighing, the other boy put down his fork, his eyebrows nodding together. I'm sorry. Izuka stiffened. About what? Had he? About all of this. His mouth tightened. About sir. After how much I talked the agency up, you're not having a very good week, are you? No, no. Izuka automatically denied. It's fine, I'm learning a lot. He made the mistake of looking at the other boy again. Mirio's gaze was fixed on the bruise that ringed around his eye, a mix of harsh purples and yellows. The same bruise that had gotten him his free breakfast. The feeling of his skin prickling guilt had him trailing off and looking away again. He was messing this all up, wasn't he? Coming to Sir Naitai's agency had been a mistake. Faking out his father had not been worth damaging his senpai's faith in his mentor. I'm learning a lot he repeated weakly. Sir might be harsh, but he knows what he's doing. That isn't just tough love, Mario said, his voice verging unheeded. I've talked with Bubble Girl and Centipede, and they agree. The way he and Gran Torino are treating you is verging on the criminal. Verging? A sarcastic thought crossed Azuka's mind, but he tamped it down. This sort of support had been the last thing he'd been expecting when he was dragged here. Bubble Girl and Centipede agree with you? He hadn't thought what with how they were Sir's employees, that they would dare speak out against him. Well, whisper against him. It didn't sound like they'd said anything to anyone but Mirio. Still, a warmth fluttered in his chest at the thought of someone caring about what was happening to him. He hadn't expected that from anyone at the agency. Even Mirio. Who was now frowning at him. Why are you so surprised? He asked, sounding genuinely upset. You're my kohai, and a student. You haven't even entered your second year yet. This sort of sparring is what third years are put through, not first years. They shouldn't be treating you this way. His voice had risen as he had spoken, and Izuka glanced around hurriedly to make sure that they weren't being watched. There were a few glances their way, but no one was staring yet thankfully. Just to be safe, though, Izuka gestured for Mirio to lower his voice. It's fine, he said quickly. I've been through worse. He snapped his mouth shut and cringed. God, what had he meant? letting that out of his mouth. How could he even compare the way he felt when his father was training to now? Being a little upset had nothing on being beaten black and blue, and he could already see the horror and suspicion warring in Mirio's eyes. I mean, I've been in tough spots before, he said, cringing. I mean, just don't worry about me, all right? I can handle it. Heroes are supposed to be strong. You're not a hero yet, though. Mirio's eyebrows were knotted together. You shouldn't have to handle it. Izuka bit the inside of his cheek again. I can handle it, he repeated. Looking down at his breakfast, he picked up a knife and began to cut into it properly. Maybe if he stuffed his face with food he'd stop saying stupid things. I still need to apologize to you properly, Mirio said after a few minutes where he just watched Izuka eat. Do you like rock music? Izuka blinked up at him at the seeming non sequitur. Um, I have no strong feelings against it. Mirio scraped his own fork against his empty plate. I have four tickets to a concert in Hosa tonight. Let me take you. 
Izuku blinked again. I okay? Who are the other two people going to be? He had to have mentioned the four tickets for a reason, right? Hosu was a ways away from the agency, so he wouldn't just waste two tickets, surely. Izuku was correct. Mario nodded and leaned back in his chair, looking relieved. My two friends, he said, his tone lightening for the first time. Tamaki and Nijire. Are you sure? Izuku tried to keep his doubt from his voice. I don't want to intrude. Mario shook his head. You won't. Honestly, it saves me the trouble of finding someone else who wants to go, and well, I kind of wanted to introduce you to them anyway. Izuku stiffened in his seat, his guard immediately flying back up from where it had begun to lower. Oh? Why would you want to do that? His senpai scratched his neck and looked away. Well, with how this internship's been going, I'm pretty sure that you're not going to want to come back, and they're both interning with separate heroes. I thought that maybe you could talk to them, and then maybe they could talk with their mentors? Izuku's stomach flopped at the thought. With how things had been going with Night Eye, he hadn't had the energy to think beyond surviving the rest of the week. Sure, Mirio Senpai was nice, but would his friends really be interested in hanging out with someone two years younger than them? He could just imagine it. Two faceless figures that nonetheless managed to sneer at him, questioning why their friend had dragged this little kid with them on their outing to a concert. Izuku shivered at the thought. I... I insist. Mirio interrupted. Reaching across the table, he grabbed Izuka's wrist. You, you don't deserve this. Any of this. At least let me give you one good night during this internship, okay? The sincerity in the other boy's voice made Izuka's mouth feel dry. Under his piercing blue gaze, his resistance shriveled like a shadow in direct sunlight. Okay. He heard himself agreeing. I'll go with you to the concert. Izuka spent the rest of the day with his stomach flip-flopping around in his abdomen. What had he been thinking? agreeing to go to a concert. With a bunch of people he didn't know and one he knew saw Night Eye as a mentor, who however nice he was, was still the hero's in turn. So it was with trepidation that he found himself waiting at the train station beside Mirio, staring at the ground in a useless attempt to hide his bruises. He felt like how he had felt before telling Kakin the truth, except he doubted that this would end as well as that time. Hey, cheer up, Mirio said, going to nudge him with his elbow before apparently thinking better of it. They're going to love you, Nijire especially. She was super jealous that I was getting a kohai to join me at the agency this week. Apparently she's been pestering her mentor Ryuku for ages to get more interns. Despite himself, Izuku perked up a little at the mention of the hero. Ryuku? The number 10 ranked hero in Japan? Your friend is interning with her? Mirio grinned down at him. Yeah. She got picked out last year. She really loves it there. Ryuku likes her a lot too. I think they've been talking about her sidekicking there for a bit once she graduates. Ah, uh, Izuka sighed, a little envy curling in his chest. That must be so nice. Ryuku, despite her fearsome quirk, always seemed so friendly in interviews. That dichotomy was a real selling point for her, he knew, so undoubtedly she played it up. He stopped himself just as the words were about to spill from his lips in one of his mutterstorms. He really was too tired for this. Constantly being on edge from waiting for the other shoe to drop at the agency was exhausting. Hey! Izuka jumped a little, looking up automatically to see who was shouting. Cheerfully darting through the crowd and waving at them was a girl with long, twisting light blue hair, wearing a pink and frilly dress that fluttered around her legs as she ran towards them. Behind her was a boy, his face half covered by his dark hair and looking like he wanted to melt into the ground as people turned to stare at them running past. Oh, hey, you're early! Mirio turned and grinned, waving back at the girl. Looking back over his shoulder, he jerked his head. Come on, this is Nijire and Tamaki. Tamaki, Nijire, this is my kohai. Oh, he's even cuter than you said. Nijire cheered as she reached them. Reaching out, she grabbed Izuka's face before he could react, squishing his cheeks. Izuka couldn't keep from wincing as her fingers dug into the bruises and she lifted his face into the light. For just a moment, her smile flickered. Then it widened, though there was a plasticity to it now, rather than the genuine warmth that had been there a moment before. Wow, she chirped. Those sure look nasty. That's no way to go to a concert. Patting her purse, a thin black thing that seemed to be bulging slightly, she took a hold of his wrist. How about we clean you up before we go a bit? Mario Kuen, we have time, right? Mario checked his watch. Yeah, we should. Th, that's really not necessary. Izuka stammered trying to free his wrist subtly without giving offense. Maybe not. 
the girl said cheerfully. But it is fun. I know a lot about covering up bruises anyways. Ryuka taught me. She said that it was a valuable skill for a heroine to have, and I need to practice anyways. As she was talking, she had started dragging him along towards the station washrooms, ignoring his attempts to escape. Wait, 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 wait! He shouted as he spotted which door she was veering towards. I can't go in there! Nijayur-san slowed slightly and looked back over her shoulder at him, puzzled. Why not? He could feel his cheeks heating up. T, that's the girl's washroom. Nijayur came to a full stop. She looked at the door. Then at the other door. Then back at him. You're right, that would be inappropriate. I'm the only girl here. Izuku had just begun to let out a breath of relief when she turned on her heel and began dragging him towards the door marked men's. No, no, no. But it was too late. They were through the door. Ah, uh, the light's so much better in here. Nijayur cheered. Less crowded too, though a bit chilly, isn't it? The last part was aimed at the man that was standing at the urinals, watching them with wide eyes. At her words, though, he flushed and hastily zipped up his pants before running out, nearly bowling Tamaki over. Nijayur didn't comment on the hasty exit, continuing to drag Izuku along towards the bathroom mirrors. Tamaki, I hold my brushes, K. She dug through her purse and pulled out a little case, shoving them into the other boy's hands as he got to his feet. Mirio, make sure no one comes until we're done, K. His senpai saluted the girl and slipped back out the door, leaving Izuku alone with the other two teenagers. Tamaki stood there, looking like he wanted to melt into the floor but nevertheless holding the brushes obediently. Izuku swallowed and looked down, his ears burning as he shifted from one foot to the other. He hadn't been expecting this sort of fuss. Gentle hands touched his jaw, making him look up. Hey, hey, Nijayur said, her smile smaller and less overwhelming. I can't put the makeup on if you don't look at me. It's not necessary. With the hands on his face he couldn't move his head away from her, but he slid his gaze away regardless. I, I wouldn't want you to waste your makeup on me. That stuff's expensive, isn't it? It's just a night out. A night out that's supposed to make you feel better. Izuka glanced over to see Tamaki looking at him through the curtain of hair brushed in front of his face. Mirio Senpai said he already had the tickets. He did, Nijayur said breezily, pulling out what looked like foundation and squirting a little onto the back of her hand. Plucking a flat brush from Tamaki's hands, she dabbed it in a little spot of liquid before taking his chin again and tilting his head towards the mirrors. The brush was cold as she began to quickly but gently spread it against his skin. He was planning to use it as more of a straight celebration with you rather than a break for you. The words took a moment to make sense. Then Izuka swallowed. He, he was going to take me to the concert anyways. Sir Naitai doesn't take a lot of interns, Tamaki said, so quiet he was almost mumbling. He'd also seen the footage of the sports festival, so he was really excited to have you coming. Yeah, he almost gave me a run for my money. Nijayur agreed. Giving the wide flat brush back to Tamaki, she took another one that was much smaller. While he'd been looking at the other boy, she'd squirted more liquid onto the back of her hand. This stuff was darker, though, as she wetted the new brush in it. Close your eye? She tapped a thumb underneath one. Izuku obeyed, and she began to delicately dab a line underneath his brow bone. I didn't know that. It almost made him feel guilty. This hadn't been a very fun week for him either, was it? I should apologize. All he'd been thinking about was making sure his father thought he was protected by all might. He hadn't thought at all about Mirio. Nijayur frowned and let go of his chin. Switching to yet another brush, this one wide and fluffy, she also pulled out a compact of pressed powder and began loading up the brush. Hey, you have nothing to apologize for. Both of you went into this internship in good faith. It's Sir Night Eye and this Grand Torino guy that should be apologizing. Izuka had to force himself not to wince. Not so much in good faith with him, he wanted to say. She's right, Tamaki said in a slightly louder and firmer voice than before. Izuka looked at him, and he quailed for a moment, before visibly stealing himself. Mirio, he told us about what they're doing to you. That's not normal, you know that, right? Of course I do, Izuka said automatically. Nijayur had been raising her brush, now heavily laden with powder to his face when she paused at his answer, trading looks with Tamaki. Izuka shifted his weight. I do, he said, looking down. I know it's not what my classmates are going through. But, the words slowed, reluctant to pass his lips. But I don't blame them, knowing what my father's probably done to them. But I can't blame them, 
knowing all the people my fathers killed? Those weren't words that he could say to these two, no matter how caring they seemed. Tamaki and Nijaya were exchanging looks again. Thankfully, though, Mirio poked his head in. Hey, guys? The train's coming in the next two minutes. Ah. Uh, thanks, Mirio Kuen, said Nijaya. We'll be right out. And with those words, she attacked Izuku's face with the powder. They're all done. She grabbed his shoulders and turned him towards the mirror. Izuku blinked in shock, his mouth dropping open. It was like he'd never had a bruise on his face at all. Leaning in, he couldn't even see any of the brush strokes or powder he'd felt being settled onto his face. Ah, uh, that's amazing, Nijire Senpai. Nijire puffed out her chest, putting her things back into her purse. Ryoka sounds a great teacher. She must be, Izuku said, turning his head this way and that. This sort of thing, I've never thought about it, but it must be such an important skill for heroes, and not just the female ones, but it's probably not one that's taught even at Yui. He was starting to mumble, but neither of the other teens seemed annoyed. Nijire looped her arm with his and began to lead him to the door, grinning at him. Yeah, she's really thoughtful about the little things like that. Come on, if you sit with me on the train, I'll tell you more. Izuka couldn't keep from smiling back at her, a small curl of excitement pushing down the discomfort that had been so omnipresent just a few seconds earlier. I'd really like that, he replied. The boss old assistant hadn't been pleased to see Kai, but Kai hadn't cared. A few rounds with his quirk, and the old man had been willing enough to help him track down some of all for one's bases. Not willing enough to keep his mouth shut with his doom and gloom predictions, but willing enough. Now, standing in front of what looked to all eyes like an old abandoned warehouse in Hosu, he wasn't thinking about those predictions, or what he had needed to do to find this place. All he was thinking about was the rage and eagerness bubbling underneath his skin. Taking off a glove, he placed a hand on the warehouse wall and used his quirk, disintegrating it. Then with his expendables behind him, they entered the place and began their work. The scientists at work didn't stand a chance. Before they could so much as scream, they were down and under control thanks to Kurono's quirk. There had been reports of more of the USJ monsters being made here, which was why Kai had brought all of his expendables, but it seemed that he'd been being overcautious. They made no move to help the ones that had been working on them, simply floating in their vats with blank eyes. There was a small snag, however. One of the scientists managed to dodge his men long enough to send out an EMP pulse that had destroyed the laptops that lined the back wall of the building. Kai had been hoping to be able to comb through the information contained there, and hopefully damage all for one's precious empire some more, but unfortunately it seemed that he would have to put more effort into things. The scientist screamed as his arm disappeared in a red mist, struggling to thrash away from the hands holding him in place. Kai watched him twist and wriggle like a half-crushed bug with dispassion flexing the hand that had just destroyed the other man's arm. I'll repeat, he said. What information was on those laptops that you were so desperate to destroy? The man continued screaming and kicking. One foot lashed out and brushed against the legs of Kai's pants, leaving a smear of dust. Kai sighed and reached down. The scream stopped with a gurgle. Kai took a deep breath, centered himself, then reached down again. The man sobbed, gasping for air. W.H. What did you? My quirk, Kai said, barely keeping his tone patient, is called overhaul. I can destroy and reassemble anything I touch. Do you know what that means? The whites of the man's eyes could be seen all around his irises. It means that this will continue until I decide to stop, Kai continued. There will be no escaping this from bleeding out, or your heart stopping from the shock of it all. If you die, all I have to do is put you back together, and then we'll start all over again. So I'll ask again, and please keep my explanation in mind before you answer. What information were you so desperate to keep away from me? Uh, I can't, he'll kill me. Kai raised an eyebrow. And I won't? The man's teeth clicked together. He was soaked with sweat, the sheen visible even in the low light of the tanks. Disgusting. Kai reached for him again. A special order! The man's panicked shout made Kai pause. He cocked his head to one side. A special order? Is all for one selling these beasts now? And no, the man stammered. No, a special order for himself. T the rest of the Nomu, they're generalists, but he wanted some made special tea to retrieve someone. As someone specific. Kai stared at the man patiently even as excitement began to twist in his belly. A special order to retrieve someone, now who, exactly, would warrant such a thing? Everyone knew that all for one's organization was simply enormous, 
even with the damage that had been done to it with the rise of the symbol of peace. Equally, everyone knew that all for one preferred to use that organization, rather than chasing down every little thing personally. Who? The man panted and licked his lips. One of the Yi students, the one that came in second out of all the first years. The Lord, the Lord wants him. Why? I, I don't know, the man whimpered. The Lord ordered it, and we obeyed. The man continued to babble but Kai ignored him. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out his phone. Typing Yui first year medalist's 20xx into the search bar, he waited patiently for the results to load. Then with a tap of his thumb, he had a picture. This student? All for one wants this student badly enough to have made-to-order monsters created specifically for the job? Kai showed him the picture. The man nodded frantically. Yes, yes, that's the boy, he said, his voice cracking. He wants that boy, brought back to him unharmed. Kai raised an eyebrow. How interesting. I see. Do you have anything else that you can tell us? The man's eyes darted around and he licked his lips. Aye, aye, aye. Kai clucked his tongue. I see. Thank you for your help then. He reached down. The man screamed for just a second as he realized what was about to happen. Then he had no throat to scream with. Overhaul Sama, Namoto said. He was telling the truth about the student. I'm aware, Namoto, Kai said calmly, even as excitement thrummed under his skin. He minimized the picture of the student and began to scroll down the article that it had come from. It was surprisingly informative, even including a few clips of the boy participating in the festival. People don't often lie under my cork either. Namoto bowed his head. Why this one brat, though? Rappa spoke up rather suddenly, drawing Kai's gaze away from his phone. What? Rappa had quickly grown bored with the questioning after the first flurry of violence was done and over with. While Kai had been talking with the surviving scientists, he had contented himself with wandering between the Numa tanks, peering into them. Now, though, he had his arms crossed over his chest and his head cocked to one side as he spoke. I watch the festival, like to see if there's anyone worth tracking down. That kid's got one hell of an enhancement quirk, but it's not super special or anything. All for one can layer his, right, and basically get the same effect? Namoto bristled. Are you questioning my quirk? He spat. Kai sent him a warning look before answering Rappa. I'm sure we'll find out soon enough, he said calmly. Though if you're worried, you can come along when we collect him first. It was a petty thing, but so perfect in how it rhymed that Kai couldn't resist. All for one had stolen a child with a quirk he greatly valued from underneath his nose. Was it not appropriate that Kai then repay the favor? In any case, we've overstayed our welcome. I believe it's time for us to leave. Rappa grunted but didn't say anything. Kurono did though. Shall we cover our tracks as planned then? He asked. Kai had been halfway back to the hole he made in the wall when he paused. Sweeping his gaze over the remains of the warehouse, he smirked behind his mask. No, he said, his gaze centering on the Nomu. I think I have a better idea. One that will lead the heroes back to all for one. Tensei was seriously regretting this internship. Oh, he wasn't regretting taking his brother for the internship. He had always planned to do so when his brother entered high school. It was practically expected in his family for the current head of the Idaten agency to take on the next generation for internships. Even if it hadn't been tradition though Tensei would have taken Tenya anyways. His little brother, even if he was a little stiff-necked right now, had the sort of heroic nature that would do their family proud in the future. No, he was just regretting that this particular internship had landed right when a deranged serial killer was running around and all hands were needed on deck. With three heroes killed, everyone was on edge waiting for a fourth. He'd barely been able to beg off that day he'd spent at the sports festival. Well, at least he'd been able to beg off to some less dangerous patrol routes. Taking a sip of his grape juice, he leaned back against the side of the building with a sigh. The sun had set over an hour ago, now, leaving him and his brother in a sea of people and lights. Hosu was an average city, a little off of his usual patrols but still familiar to him with how its streets were laid out. He would have preferred to take his brother out on his first patrols on their family's usual stomping grounds, but well, you couldn't always get what you wanted. Tenya at least didn't seem to be upset, but he was never upset with any chance for them to spend time together. Nissan, I mean Ingenium? Is something wrong? Tensei looked over at his brother and smiled tiredly. His little brother was too kind sometimes. Despite his stiff mannerisms, 
He truly had the heart of a hero and that was something that Tensei truly appreciated in stressful times like this. Don't worry about it, Tenya. It's just the normal stress of being a hero. His brother frowned up at him. Are you sure? I could. Tensei chuckled and ruffled his hair, cutting him off. He appreciated the kind thought, even if it was useless. As intense as his brother could be when convinced he was in the right about something, not even he could override the commission's schedules. I told you not to worry about it, he said. When there's a serial killer out and about we can't complain about the extra work. Your friend didn't when he sent us that analysis, did he? When his brother had first come to him with his friend's thoughts on Stain's quirk, Tensei had honestly just been humoring him. He hadn't expected much from a high school student, no matter what hero course they were a part of. After all, if their own analysts were having so much trouble with it, what were the chances that some kid would crack the mystery? Apparently, very high. As he read further and further, Tensei had felt guiltier and guiltier for his immediate dismissal. The evidence and how Midoriya had organized it had been compelling, laid out with a confidence that seemed anathema to the nervous boy he met a few weeks ago. While he couldn't officially pass it on to the higher-ups in the investigation, too many questions as to how Midoriya had gotten this information in the first place, he made sure to pass it around to the heroes on the ground with him. Out of all the theories he'd seen, this one made the most sense, and if it kept his fellow heroes safe, it didn't really matter where the information had come from. His brother blushed and adjusted his glasses. Still, it seems unfair that you're being forced to take so many shifts in a row. Eight hours of sleep. And he was off, chopping at the air as he ranted. Tensei swallowed a chuckle, allowing his brother to rant. He knew it was merely out of nervousness, not actual indignation. Though he wasn't wrong, a second twelve-hour shift with only a four-hour break between the two wasn't a pace that he could keep up forever. His watch beeped, marking an end to their break. With a sigh, he straightened, putting his helmet back on. All right, that's our break. Time to get back to work, he said, cutting his brother off mid-chop. Of course, sir, Tenya said, hastily jamming his own back on as well. At least it was a quiet shift, Tensei thought several hours later, checking his watch again. They were just a few minutes away from the end of it now, the streets were mostly empty of people, and Tensei had never been so happy. His eyes were gritty with exhaustion and all he wanted was to sink back into his bed and never leave it. So, of course, that was when they heard the cry of pain from a nearby alleyway. Nissan, I mean, Ingenium. Tensei squeezed his eyes shut in exasperation and immediately felt terrible about it. I hear it, he said, opening them again. Stay behind me and if I tell you to run, run, understand? Yes, Ingenium. Tenya's tone was subdued. Tensei would have to apologize for his overly harsh tone later. The alleyway that the noise had come from was swathed in shadows. The sun had set over an hour ago, leaving only the neon lights of the businesses around them to illuminate the streets. Most of them were red on this particular one, splashing across the pale walls of the buildings like blood and reminding Tensei of the gore-slick mouth of a cannibal as he walked into the alleyway. Inside, the impression only grew. Dark and dank, it smelled of forgotten, rotting things. Walking slowly with all of his senses on high alert, Tensei peered through the gloom trying to see who had cried out in pain. It wasn't a loud sound. Just the sound of a foot stepping on a gritty, dirty brick. It was enough for Tensei to dodge Stain's first swipe, though. Stain! Tensei shouted. Tenya, call the others. Oh? When the first swipe had failed the serial killer had landed in a crouch, his long tongue sticking out from his mouth. Calling for backup? How unusual. I wouldn't expect that from Ingenium. He sneered the last word from behind the jagged-edged sword he was holding up in front of his face. Tensei couldn't keep himself from bristling at the insult. My family, he began hotly. Stain's sneer only deepened. Yes. Your family business. His tongue snaked out again, sliding against the steel of his blade. As if true heroism can be treated like a business, like something to package and sell. His eyes narrowed. You fake hero. Tensei narrowed his eyes right back until he caught a glimpse of something dark on the edge of the killer's blade. Something wet and black, and frighteningly close to Stain's thick pink tongue. Panic reached into his chest and squeezed. He lurched forward, desperate to get that bloody knife even as he tried to figure out where he had been cut. But he wasn't fast enough. Maybe it was the exhaustion that had been tugging at him before this, but Tensei's body refused to move fast enough to keep Stain's tongue from swiping over that black, gleaming stain. Midstep, his body froze. Already moving, 
He couldn't stop in time before he was crashing head over heels onto the ground, his armor scraping against the asphalt. His view spun wildly as he rolled across the ground until coming to rest at Stain's feet, a perverse offering to the villain's bloodlust. A noise rumbled out of Stain's chest that sounded like a mix between a laugh and a growl. He straightened out of his crouch, holding his sword by his side. He barely had to move his arm to lay its edge against Tensei's exposed throat. Looking up at him, Tensei could see how the man's eyes burned with a fanatic's light as he began to speak. I'd be purifying the world killing you here. Stupid, 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 Tensei chanted in his head. Stupid. Tenya's friend had said that Stain's quirk likely didn't need much blood to activate. He should have worn his armored undersuit, but he'd been so tired and hadn't been expecting any trouble. He wasn't supposed to be in any of the areas where Stain had been spotted, so he thought that he'd be fine if he just went with his lighter undersuit. Then there was a roar of engines, and his brother shouts. Anaya San! Tenya! Tensei shouted, dread stabbing through him. What are you doing? Stain had been forced to jump back by Tenya's kick and was back in his crouch, his eyes narrowed. Taking on your younger brother, you aren't even trying to hide your nepotism. He bared his teeth. Disgusting. Tensei could see how his brother stiffened at that and desperately tried to get him to focus. Tenya, you need to get out of here. I can't leave you in I san You have to. This isn't a training exercise, this is a real villain. I've fought a real villain before. Let me protect you. Tenya! Tensei shouted as Stain moved, sprinting forward from his crouch. His brother barely turned in time to avoid that stab that Stain shot forward. Twisting in the air, he snapped out a kick and then jumped back, forced away by the flurry of slashes that Stain unleashed. I'll deal with you later, the serial killer hissed. His eyes were wide and mad, utterly focused on Tensei's little brother. No, don't, he said, but it was useless. Behind him, he heard more growls of his little brother's engines and the awful scraping sound of Stain's blades. Tenya, he shouted. Tenya, please run. But it was useless. He was useless. There was another growl of Tenya's engine revving up, and then a sputter and cough, nearly drowned out by his little brother's scream of pain. Tensei's eyes rolled around helplessly in his head as he strained them, trying to see what happened. Tenya! Chapter 28 Oh wow! Izuka breathed as he watched the girl in the video finish applying the last bit of powder to her face. She did that so quickly. I know, right? Nijaya senpai agreed, grinning. Leaning together. Izuka had been a red, sweaty mess for the first ten minutes of the train ride. Now though, watching videos of makeup YouTubers together, he felt more like he was sitting with an older sister than anything else. All of them, Mirio and Tamaki Senpai included, felt like the older siblings he dreamed of as a kid. He hadn't expected this sort of comfortable kindness when he'd agreed to go to the concert, but he certainly wasn't complaining now that he was receiving it. As the video ended, she moved her thumb to hover the next video's thumbnail. Ryoka recommended her when she started teaching me. She said that these were the only videos she could find where the host didn't ramble on for half an hour about brands. She does comedy videos too. Really? Yeah, we can one of them next if you want. Nijire shoved her phone into his hands. Here, hold this. I have some earbuds in my purse. Izuka nearly dropped the phone from the abruptness, but luckily she didn't seem to notice as she started digging through her purse. He was starting to wonder if there was some sort of support technology in there, considering how much she seemed to be able to store in there. The four of them were sitting in the plush seats of the bullet train, him and Nijire behind Mirio and Tamaki Senpai. Izuka had been surprised how nice the train was, having expected just the usual train ride, but Mirio had just laughed when he questioned it and called it part of the treat along with the concert itself. Glancing up at the seats ahead of them, he saw that Mirio and Tamaki still had their heads bent together in conversation. Despite himself, he frowned a little at that. He knew that it was likely just them catching up, but the small paranoid voice in the back of his head that never quieted down was suspicious. As soon as they had sat down, the two of them had begun a low conversation, too quiet for Izuku to hear without using a quirk. If he hadn't been sitting beside Nijire, he would have risked activating one. However, all of the ones he did have mutated his ears noticeably. As well, Nijire had quickly taken up all of his attention with videos on her phone leaving no room for him to pay attention to his other senpais. Izuka couldn't help but be fascinated by them. He'd been amazed by how quickly the girl had covered up the bruises littering his face in the washroom, 
and seeing how she had done it in video form had been far more pleasant to pay attention to than what was probably a completely harmless conversation between friends. In his back pocket, Izuka's own phone buzzed, making him jump a little. Shifting his grip so that he was only using one hand to hold Nijire's phone, he pulled out his own and quickly tapped in the pin to open it. It was a notification in the class chat. Izuka had said it so that he wouldn't be disturbed by anything other than an at everyone, but he very nearly put his phone back in his pocket without checking the message anyways. Kaminari was very fond of showing everyone the newest memes and utterly shameless in his use of the notification system. Wait. Izuka narrowed his eyes. The username of the person that had alerted everyone. It wasn't Kaminari, or any of his friends. It was Ida. Found them. Nijire chirped, leaning back against him so quickly that he didn't have time to put his phone away. Ooh, what's that? Izuka's first instinct was to lie. His mouth was half open before he managed to stop himself. Ida was his classmate and his friend, he chided himself. It's not unusual for him to message you. My friend just message everyone in the class group chat, he said after a second. He doesn't usually do that. Nijire hummed, her eyes sparkling with curiosity. Shifting so that her chin was resting on his shoulder, she poked him in the arm. What does it say? I haven't had a chance to check, Izuka replied, even as he double-tapped the icon with his thumb. He's a pretty serious guy though, so maybe it's some sort of announcement. He broke off halfway through his sentence and frowned as the app opened showing what Ida had sent to everyone. It wasn't an announcement. There weren't any words at all, in fact. All there was was a set of coordinates. Underneath, his other classmates were already questioning what Ida meant by the message, with Kaminari loudly wondering if he was trying to Google a restaurant or something and had opened the wrong app like some sort of grandpa. The others were already making fun of him, so Izuka focused in on the coordinates. The map they were set on looked familiar. Ha, huh, looks like that's Hosu. Nijire's breath puffed against his cheek, but Izuku didn't blush. He couldn't, not with the concern beginning to prickle through his veins. Of course it was in Hosu. That was where Ida had been spending his internship with his brother, helping to patrol and free up more heroes to look for Stain. There was no reason why seeing a location in Hosu should worry him. Despite that, the prickling in his veins began to increase, starting to feel more like ice water was flowing through them rather than blood. Why would your friend send his location? Nijire asked, oblivious to the dark thoughts beginning to bubble up like hot tar in the back of Izuka's mind. Did he find a good restaurant? What's his name, by the way? Is he nice? What's his quirk? Before Izuka could answer, a hero crashed through the wall of the train a couple of seats ahead. The screech of brakes filled the air, and the lights flickered. After a heartbeat, Screams of the civilians joined the cacophony as Anuma with six arms and what seemed to be the trademark exposed brain of the biological monstrosities began to climb in after the hero. Izuku shot to his feet, gripping the head of the seat in front of and behind him, the edges of his phone cutting into his hand. His body began to move. But Mirio and Tamaki moved faster. Tentacles exploded from the dark-haired teen's arms, wrapping around the Numa before it could get more than halfway into the train car and then Mirio was sliding through his friend's arms to land several punches directly into the pinkish-gray brain matter that was so thoughtfully exposed above the Numa's goggle-eyed stare. Shockingly, it did not die. It made a strange, shrieking noise instead and toppled out of car, dragging Tamaki with it, and with Mirio following at his friend's heels. It had happened so fast that Izuka hadn't even managed to get out into the aisle. Nijire didn't seem surprised. She had moved just as fast as the boys, getting over to the hero that had been thrown into the car and making sure that none of the panicking civilians stepped on him. Pushing his way through the crowd, Izuka saw that she was helping him sit up and decided to go and check on his other senpais. It was easier than it seemed. No one seemed to be eager to get near the hole that the Numa had made, so there was a large empty space around it. Stumbling as his foot caught on the straps of someone's purse, Izuka muttered an apology. "As sorry. And stopped. Because there, framed like a painting, he could see that the city of Hosu was on fire. In his hand, his phone beeped. Feeling like he was in a dream, he looked down at it. It was a message from Todoroki. He was confused over why Ida had sent out his location. Like a bucket of ice water being dumped over his head, Izuka snapped out of his daze and looked back at the burning city spread out below. It was chaos in the streets. Beneath the raised tracks of the train, Izuka could see his senpai still fighting the Numa that had tried to climb into the train, 
Tamaki tying limbs up so that Mirio could dance closer and pound on the monster's vulnerable bits. A little ways away, there were several heroes trying to deal with several burning cars that seemed to have set the building they'd crashed into on fire as well. Flames were already licking through the shattered windows, shining through in a strange strobe-like pattern as they greedily feasted on the oxygen flowing in. More heroes were trying to herd away a group of civilians, and up above the ruined and burning buildings he thought he could see something weaving in and out of the smoke. His phone chimed again. It was Ishido, echoing Kaminari and Todoroki's confusion. Ida was in the city. He had sent his location, with no other information, something that was extremely out of character for him. Izuka swallowed and gripped his phone tighter. The city was on fire and dealing with what looked like an invasion of Nimu. Ida was in trouble and no one would be able to go look for him. No one but Izuku. Just like before, Izuka's body moved without thought. He jumped from the hole in the train car, ignoring the screams of the people behind him. The noise rang out and mixed with the alarms and screams coming from outside as well, and as Izuka hung in the cool, smoky night air, the part of him that had been holding him back from using all of the quirks he had at his disposal shut off. It was like the USJ all over again, but this time, there would be no rescue coming if they just held on. His friend was in trouble. How would he be able to live with himself if he didn't do everything he could to save him? With a soft pop, he disappeared from the bit of night sky he'd been occupying, teleporting to his limit of ten feet away, and then teleporting again, repeating the procedure over and over. He didn't look behind himself as he flew through the air, too focused on getting to his friend before it was too late. It was almost a pity. If he had, he would have seen Nijire staring after him in shock, her hand outstretched where she had tried to grab his collar to save him from falling. Tenya had crashed down against the wall of the alley, unable to move except to scream out in pain. His leg, his leg, the villain's blade had moved almost too fast to see, sliding between his exhaust pipes and biting through the flesh until it hit the metal that made up the rest of the engine built into his leg. That would have been bad enough, but then he had licked the blood off of the blade with his grotesque tongue and Tenya hadn't been able to move at all. Midoriya had been right. It was a paralysis quirk based on villain being able to ingest his victim's blood. Somehow, the thought was not comforting. Tenya! His brother screamed, paralyzed as well and facing away. He must think. I'm okay, and I I san. Tenya called back, only for the ragged edge of Stain's sword to catch the delicate skin underneath his chin. If Tenya hadn't already been paralyzed, he would have frozen. You're fine? The villain growled. His tongue flicked out, running along his lips. Calling out to your brother. He spat the word out like it was foul. When a villain is right in front of you, I'm not even surprised. Despite the knife at his throat, Tenya couldn't keep from glaring at man in front of him. Of course I called out to him, he said hotly. He's my brother. The blade bit into his neck, letting a dribble trickle down its front to stain his undersuit. The villain sneered. Because he's your brother, or because he's the current CEO of your corporation? I suppose your family would find replacing him inconvenient. He shifted his grip, the edge lifting from Tenya's neck only to be replaced by the sword's point. It would be difficult, wouldn't it, with your meal ticket gone? Meal ticket? Tenya glared up at the villain. His brother was no meal ticket. He was the hero in Genium. Stop it! Tensei shouted. He's just a kid! Stain ignored him. Tenya wanted to reassure him, but with the point of the blade at his neck, and his brother lying helplessly on the ground like him, after he'd shouted for Tenya to run. Tenya decided that discretion was the better part of valor here. Better than antagonizing Stain further. He'd send out their location, so hopefully if he cooperated, let the villain keep talking. Stain seemed to take his silence as agreement. His lip curled. I'm doing the world a favor, wiping you two out. No! The raw pain in his brother's voice made Tenya's throat tighten in regret. The tip of the blade pressed a little harder against his skin, breaking it and a dark blur slammed into stain so hard that the blade snapped. Glittering in the dim light of the alleyway, Tenya watched the shattered remains of the sword bounce off the other wall across from him and strained his eyes to the side, trying to see who had just hit stain and saved him. Had one of his classmates alerted the hero they were with? No. No, it wasn't a hero that had just saved him and Tensei. Standing half in the shadows and facing away from Tenya, Tensei lying just behind him, it took Tenya a moment to figure out who it was but then the figure tilted its head slightly, revealing a few green curls in the low light of the faraway street. In a low, furious tone that was antithetical to the gentle boy that Tenya knew, Midoriya spoke. 
Stop playing around. I know you're not down. Stain snarled and jumped back up from the ground, red smeared across his face. More knives glinted in his hands and he lunged towards the figure that had knocked him down in the first place. Midoriya didn't move. Tenya opened his mouth to shout a warning. Tensei did shout one. But Stain stopped. Mid-lunge, he abruptly stopped and twisted, using his momentum to instead jump further back into the alleyway and holding his knives in a defensive position. And then the wave of killing intent smashed into Tenya and he realized why Stain was acting like that. It wasn't just his voice that was furious. At Midoriya's sides, his hands were curled into fists that trembled with restrained wrath. Do you know how many people are in trouble right now? He asked, the words caressing Tenya's ears like the razor-sharp edge of a knife. Did you know that there's an invasion of Numa going on right now, while you're attacking heroes? Stain bared his teeth, but his eyes were wary and didn't stray from Midoriya, even as Tensei made a choking sound from the ground. Do you know, Midoriya said, taking a step forward, how many people could have been saved by Ingenium by now? How many people could you have saved? Stain snarled, still in a defensive stance. You're talking as if I forced you to come save your fake hero friends. Of course I came to save them. Stain sneered. Of course, can't waste your time actually saving the little people. His grip tightened on his blade. You're just like every other hero out there, only concerned with yourselves and your charts. Tenya could see Midoriya's jaw flex and his shoulders rise, the chill in the air returning. Tensei grunted, sounding frantic. Midoriya, he said. Don't argue with him. Take Tenya and run. Stain's sneer deepened. Yes, run, he said. Run and leave this trash to me. Don't let him trick you into a fight. As Tenya's older brother begged, Stain moved. He surged forward, his knives flashing. They never even got close to touching Midoriya. His arms bulged, and he clapped, and Stain was flying backwards head over heels and Tenya's ears were ringing as he was pushed back a little as well by the back blast. His armor rasped against the brick of the alleyway's wall. And Midoriya was darting after him, a massive fist cocked back. Stain jumped just in time, bouncing off of the wall and onto a fire escape, his eyes wild beneath the black tangle of his hair. He clearly hadn't expected Midoriya to move like that. Midoriya jumped into the air and clapped his hands again, sending a gale down the narrow confines of the alleyway and making the fire escape shriek. Balanced on the balls of his feet, Stain nearly fell, just catching himself in time. The city is on fire! Midoriya screamed. People are dying! He'd been blasted back by his own blow. Reaching out with enlarged fingers he stopped himself by digging them into the wall, twisting so that his feet were underneath him. And you're trying to kill one of the people who can help. Letting go he began to run forward, his sheer speed keeping him defying gravity. Who the hell do you think you are? As he reached the fire escape, Stain was waiting. Pulling out another sword from one of his sheaths he slashed it through the air. Midoriya dodged it with contemptuous ease twisting so that he slid through the narrow space on the escape's landing and catching himself on the railing. Tenya saw the knife that Stain had been hiding behind his back starting to come down and tried to shout a warning. He didn't need to though, because before the metal could connect with flesh Midoriya ripped the entire fire escape off of the wall with a scream. Stain was fast. He jumped off, avoiding being caught by the twisting metal. Then he runs towards Tensei's still-prone body. I am the one who will purify this world! He snarled raising the knife again. Midoriya shot forward, a feral look on his face. Get away from them! He screamed. Only for Stain to stop, the blade flipping in his hand so that its point was now facing towards Midoriya's rapidly approaching chest. Tenya opened his mouth to scream. Then a naked blonde man shot out of the ground, uppercutting Stain with a crack that Tenya could hear from where he was lying. Power! Power! Izuka's heart was thundering in his chest. His head was buzzing. His eyes were watering. Teleporting over the buildings and fires, seeing the people panicking and heroes fighting the Numu, he had to force himself not to stop and help everyone he saw. He had asked Stain's reasons for attacking heroes, attacking Ingenium, and hadn't been able to hear his answer over the ringing in his ears. He had never been so angry in his life. Not even when his father had been feeding him quirks as he begged him not to, he'd only been sad and afraid at those times. But passing by all those people and being unable to help, and then seeing Ingenium and Ida on the ground with the serial killer hovering over them. Stain crashed to the ground from Mirio Senpai's punch and Izuku didn't even pause to wonder how his senpai had known where he was. 
he just began to storm after the criminal, corks burning under his skin. Only for a strong hand to grab his shoulder and stop him. Whipping his head around, his teeth bared, Izuka curled his hand into a fist. Hey, Mirio said. Let me and Nijire handle this. You focus on getting your friend out of here. Stain was stirring on the ground, slowly pushing himself onto his hands and knees. You were right about his quirk, weren't you? I can't be touched in Nijire is long range. I have quirks to handle that too, Izuka thought, barely biting back the words in time. He was still so angry, could feel the quirks just underneath his skin, wanting to be unleashed. Midoriya! Ida's raspy voice was like a cold shock. Suddenly Izuka was back down on earth, without the fire in his chest to make him float. Of course, of course, he'd come here to save Ida and his brother, not fight Stain. Izuka nodded jerkily as Stain struggled to his feet, clinging to the alley wall. Turning, he rushed over to Ida and his brother. Tamaki was already there, lifting Ingenium from the ground. Midoriya kun, he mumbled. You really worried us when you ran off like that. Izuka blinked back tears that were suddenly springing to his eyes. They'd all come after him? I'm sorry, he said, his voice cracking. I just saw that my friend was in trouble, and no one else would be able to help him. There was an odd noise from above, and then the sensation of air being displaced and a crash. Looking up, Izuka saw Nijire floating in midair, a stern look that even in his short time of knowing her Izuka knew was unusual on her face. You're lucky that I saw the location before you bolted. She chided loudly, letting off another blast. You're really used to handling things alone, aren't you? You need to remember that your senpais are with you too. Izuka ducked his head. I'm sorry, he repeated. Stain shouted something, only to be cut off by the sound of a meaty thud. Glancing over his shoulder, he saw Stain on the ground again, Mirio kneeling on top of him and wrapping a set of zip ties he'd pulled from nowhere around the man's wrists. Swallowing, Izuka turned away and trudged over to Ida. Bending down and picking him up, he couldn't meet the other boy's eyes. What had he been thinking? Running in and starting to fight Stain. He should have been focusing on getting his friend and his brother away from the serial killer. Sorry. He mumbled as he joined Tamaki in carrying the two out of the alleyway. I'm sorry. Ingenium grunted from where he was slung over Tamaki's shoulder. What are you apologizing for? He asked, sounding bewildered. You just saved both of our lives. Izuka bit his lower lip. Nisan is right, Ida said, his voice strained from Izuka's shoulder digging into his gut. It's because of you that my brother and I are alive. If you hadn't come across us. I didn't, Izuka interrupted. I just went to the location Ida sent out. Stain's words reverberated through his head. I ignored so many people in trouble. Hey, hey, Ingenium said, grunting a little as Tamaki set him down and leaned him against the building wall. Don't listen to that villain, okay? He's a lunatic and a hypocrite. He'd find something to nitpick no matter what you did, got it? Izuka set Ida down beside his brother. But... You're a first-year student, Ingenium said, his voice stern. You don't have your provisional license. You haven't even finished your first term. Even if you did stop, no hero in their right mind would have had you do anything but evacuate. He looked like he wanted to shrug but couldn't. I mean, I'm not thrilled that you ended up fighting Stain yourself. Izuka couldn't keep himself from flinching. But you could easily make the argument that if you had you would have likely ended up with a knife buried in your back. Ingenium's voice softened again. You did a good job tonight, Midoriya-san. So stop beating yourself up. Yeah. Turning his head, Izuka saw Nijire and Mirio emerge from the alleyway, towing an unconscious stain behind them. Each of them had a hand underneath the villain's armpit, and Mirio was holding a garbage can lid in front of his crotch. Even if you didn't save everyone, you still saved someone. Mirio continued. Sir always says that a hero needs to keep their goal in mind in a battle. The other heroes had it covered. Exactly. Ingenium agreed. He paused for a moment. I assume, since I still can't turn my head, that you managed to take him down? Yes, sir. Ingenium, sir. Mirio began to lift the hand holding the garbage can lid before clearly thinking better. My name is Mirio Togata, sir, and this is Nijire Hadu and Tamaki Amajiki. Oh, right, I think I've heard of you. The big three, was it? Mirio beamed, and Izuka relaxed a little, letting the words of the others percolate through his mind. It felt a little like he was taking the easy way out, believing them, but they were heroes, or at least closer to being them than he was, right? Surely they knew what they were talking about. With the thoughts playing through Izuka's head, 
He wasn't paying attention to his surroundings, like he usually would have been. If he had, he would have been able to spot the Numa flying up above them as they talked. It was the jolt that he would remember most, not the pain of the scrapes the monster would leave on his arms, or the panic in the other's eyes. It was the jolt of his feet abruptly leaving the ground, like his stomach was falling from his body. He hadn't even known what was going on. Above him, the Numa screeched, and suddenly he was flying, flying, flying away, the other shrinking. Panic hit like an ice storm, icing over his skin and chilling him to the core. A Numa had him, a Numu, only his father could make Numu. Distantly, he could hear shouts from below. He thought that someone might be moving, but all he could see was the claws wrapped around his arms. He reached inside, to the cork that he'd used earlier that night to get to Ida in time. A touch, another jolt, the sensation of falling. And then he was in Nijire's arms. They were lowering down to the ground, and Nijire was talking but Izuka couldn't hear her over the ringing in his ears. There were the sounds of a fight. What was that quirk? Nijire asked in a low tone in his ear. It's not an enhancement one. Chapter 29 Shudo frowned down at his phone, watching the others in his class chatter over the location that Ida had sent. The back of his neck was prickling, like it always had before his father had started a surprise bout of training. Something about this was wrong, and he couldn't shake the feeling that Ida was in trouble. Biting the inside of his cheek, he tried to push the feeling down. Even if there was something wrong, Ida was in Hosu. There was no way that he would be able to get there in time to help. Something wrong, kitten? Shudo blinked and looked up from his phone at Tiger. Sorry, he said, putting his phone back into his pocket. No, I was just checking the class chat. The tall, powerfully built man smiled at him. He had changed out of his frilly uniform and his still wet hair showed that he had cleaned up. Bred and raised for heroics as he was, Shudo had been surprised how much he had learned during his internship with the wild, wild pussycats. Originally, when Aizawa sensei had taken him aside and handed him the offer from the group, he had believed that it was only because they operated so far from his father's usual stomping grounds in the city. Endeavor was an urban creature, through and through, needing to be around people so that they could see and praise his heroics. The pussycats, as popular as they were, were rescue heroes that mostly operated out of Japan's mountains and forests. Getting the number two hero to give up custody of his masterpiece was no doubt going to be a struggle so keeping him out of the blast range was obviously a concern. He'd been surprised once he arrived, though, when they immediately took him aside to talk about his quirk. Namely, the fire half of his quirk. Aizawa-sensei had apparently felt guilty about not noticing him not using his fire half, and was worried that he could have some trouble getting it under control after not using it for so long. Rather than sending him to another fire-using hero, he had instead called in a favor from the pussycats. With all of their rescue work, they were familiar with firefighting, and knew a few things from summers spent controlling wildfires. More than a few fire heroes had been involved in wildfire control, setting fire traps, and so Aizawa had figured that they were probably the best heroes to help him without risking triggering anything. Shuto had at first been insulted. He wasn't weak, he'd lived for years with Endeavor, he could handle his reactions to fire, and he told the pussycats so that first night. The worried looks they'd shot each other had made him feel about as tall as a worm. They had explained further, that just because he could take it didn't mean that he should have to. He wasn't quite sure that he believed that, but as the week went on, he couldn't deny that he had appreciated not having any reminders of his father around as he slowly began to work on controlling his flames. In that case, Tiger said, would you mind going and fetching Tomoko? She was just finishing up entering the volunteers into the system in the back office. Shino's busy with Kota and Ryuko is cooking tonight. It took a moment to remember where the back office was. The Pussycats compound was quite large. Apparently they regularly helped run rescue training programs for several hero schools, and so their buildings were fairly widely spread out. The back office was actually in the building closest to the road. He'd asked Ragdoll why it was called the back office and she'd laughed, explaining that since most of their actual business was done in the main buildings and they were otherwise so isolated from people. The small building was closer to the idea of a back office than the one actually in the back of their main buildings. Having seen the messy, lived-in office that she was referring to in the compound, he had been forced to agree. Standing up, he dusted off his hands on his front. He'd been wanting to take a shower, but it wasn't a long walk. You could open a window in one of the main buildings and easily been heard in the other, as Ragdoll herself had demonstrated the first night he'd arrived. Shouting back and forth with Pixie Bob about what they were going to have for dinner. Sure, I can do that. 
Thanks. Tiger was already turning when he abruptly stopped and turned around. By the way, what would you like for dessert, pudding or manju? Manju. He tried pudding the first night, and used to sweets. Endeavor had had him on a carefully calibrated diet for most of his life, with very little sugar. He'd found it too rich for his tastes, but Fuyumi had snuck him manju before, and he knew he liked those. Please, he added belatedly. Endeavor had never thanked anyone for anything, and being out here had helped him understand how to be unlike him in the ways that really mattered, rather than just denying his fire. Tiger nodded. See you soon, he said, walking away. Shudo nodded and began to head away as well. The walk was nice. It being late May, there was still a good amount of sunlight left as he followed the path down to the visitor's center. It spilled through the branches of the trees like honey, underlining the sweet and heavy scent of flowers in the air. Soon enough, he had reached the building. Swinging the unlocked door open, he stepped inside. Immediately, his skin prickled. Something was wrong. Straightening, he reached behind himself to catch the door before it swung closed with a clunk. He scanned the room, trying to pick out what was making the hairs on the back of his neck stand up like this. It looked normal enough. The top of the front desk that he could see was neat and clean, except for a bottle of hand sanitizer and a bell for people to ring for service. The floor was neat and clean, and moving further in he could see the stacks of paper beside the computer that was handled by a part-time worker hadn't been disturbed. Still, though, his mind was screaming at him that something was wrong. But he couldn't see or hear anything. He couldn't hear anything. Ice rippled down his spine. Ragdoll always sang or hummed when she was working. Radios didn't work this deep in the mountains so she had told him she had decided to be her own radio station early on as part of the team. If she was here, Shudo should have been hearing her at least humming some sort of tune. Behind the desk was a door that led to the back office. It was open just a crack. Shudo held his breath as he placed his palm against the warm wood and slowly pushed it open. The office was a mess. Unlike the front desk, the room looked like a typhoon had hit it. Papers and other office supplies littered the floor. Filing cabinets had been flung open, and the computer monitor on the desk was shattered, glowing like a warped rainbow. And standing in the middle of the mess, one hand tangled in Ragdoll's blue hair while the other covered her face as she struggled and kicked, was a man. Wearing a crisp black suit, the man was a giant. So large that Ragdoll almost looked like a child in his hands, he hadn't turned around as Shudo opened the door, only allowing him to see the man's short cropped curly white hair. Fire bubbling underneath his skin, Shudo took a step forward, his mouth opening to shout, but no sound came out as the man turned his head just slightly towards him, like he had heard something, and a wave of terror crashed over Shuto like a tsunami. In an instant, he saw his death. He saw the pussycat's death. He even saw Koda, a child, he saw his death. He saw them lying on the ground, surrounded by their blood and viscera, their eyes staring sightlessly up at the ceiling as the insects began to feast underneath their skin, making their bodies twitch as they crawled in and out. Fat and well-fed as their bodies collapsed in on themselves. As Shudo watched, the man turned back to his original victim. Ragdoll suddenly stiffened, her spine arching, and then went terrifyingly limp. The man removed his hand from Ragdoll's face, revealing her battered and blood-smeared features. Still holding her by her hair, he turned like he had heard something and faced Shuto head-on. Shuto would never forget this moment, staring into the red eyes of death. Like a rabbit spotted by a wolf, he was frozen, unable to even draw a breath. The man let go of Ragdoll carelessly, like she was a piece of trash. She fell to the ground heavily, but again Shuto didn't hear anything. He wanted to move towards her but he didn't. He didn't dare take his eyes off of the man as he began to walk towards him. He didn't move, didn't even tremble as the man reached towards him. He could see blood smeared across the man's fingers and palm. Gently, the man patted his cheek, one eye closing in a lazy wink. He raised his other hand and pressed a finger to his lips. Then he was walking past Shudo, and was gone. Shuto began to tremble when the sound came back, the low whine of damaged electronics and the buzz of the fluorescent lights above. He still couldn't breathe as he turned his head to stare at the crumpled form of Ragdoll. Then he heard a bird chirp from outside. Like it had just given him permission to do so, he fell to his knees and crawled over to the woman, gasping and wheezing for breath like he'd been strangled, his heart pounding in his throat. Her hair had fallen over her face when she was dropped. His hand shaking, Shudo brushed it away. Covered with blood and blooming bruises, he could only see the whites of her eyes. His chest, 
already tight from fear, squeezed back shut. Choking, struggling for air, he tried to call out for help. He tried, his throat feeling like it had been seared shut, and only heard a whisper pass through his lips. Help! Ragdoll was lying so still. Helplessly, he pawed at her neck, trying to find a pulse. His eyes burning, he forced himself to suck in a stuttering breath. Help! The word was a little louder this time. He was trembling so hard that he couldn't feel anything. He couldn't feel a pulse, and she was lying so still. The smell of fabric burning filled his nose as his flames flared up along his left side. Like a knife, the scream tore out of his throat. Help! Mirio took a deep breath and flexed his hand over the hospital room's doorknob. Even with Nijair and Tamaki's warm hands on his back supporting him, he felt like he was going to throw up. He had been so excited to bring Midoriya into the agency. So excited to have a kohai to, to not goof off with, but maybe have the chance to work with. Someone who was a little closer to his age and experience level, when even Bubble Girl had years on him. He thought that Sir was simply interested in someone that seemed to have the same sort of analytical fighting style as him, or something like that. He hadn't expected it to be an excuse to lure in the subject of an investigation. An investigation that turned out to be correct. No. Mirio corrected himself. Nijire had told him as soon as they had arrived at the hospital, Midoriya having been dragged there by Ingenium and his brother as soon as their paralysis had worn off, shortly after the Numa had, Midoriya had, well, after Midoriya was removed from the Numa's claws. Yes, his kohai had clearly shown a quirk that was not an enhancement one, which suggested that Sir's hypothesis was correct, but from how Midoriya had reacted there was clearly more going on here than Sir had realized. And even if he had been completely correct his investigation was so cruel that no one would accept it in a court, so it didn't really matter that he had alerted All Might and Yuya about how Midoriya was being treated. Um, Tamaki mumbled. Is the door stuck? Mirio stiffened, and tried to flash a smile at his friends. Ah, uh, sorry about that. He chirked, feeling the strain of his smile. Got caught up in my thoughts. Neither of his friends smiled back. They just transferred the worried looks they'd been shooting the door to him. Turning away from them, his ears burning, Mirio twisted the doorknob before they could ask him if he was okay. The room was tiny, with a single small window in the far corner by the bed. A trade-off for the attached bathroom and privacy, according to Ingenium. He and his brother were still answering questions from the police, which was why Mirio and his friends had decided to confront Midoriya now. Neither of them had seen the teleportation, still being paralyzed, which Mirio couldn't help but thankful for. He didn't want to have to explain that to them on top of confronting Midoriya. Except Midoriya wasn't in the room. Mirio took a step in and swept his gaze around the room. The bed looked a little must, a half-empty glass on the table beside it that had clearly been drunk from. The window was closed, and they were on the eighth floor. There was a noise from the bathroom. Mirio's head snapped around, and he wanted to smack his forehead. Of course, if he wasn't in the room, then he was probably in the bathroom. Sir always said that when you hear hooves think horses not zebras. No. Mirio pulled his mind away from Sir. Walking over to the bathroom door, he twisted the doorknob and pushed against it. It opened just a crack. Then it slammed shut, like someone on the other side had thrown their whole body against it, desperate to keep him out. Someone who was breathing loudly and harshly, like they were struggling to hold back tears. Mirio took a step back. Behind him, either of his friends moved. He could feel their looks of concern, though. He swallowed to clear his throat. Midoriya? he said. There was a low whine from behind the door, and then a muffled sob. Mirio swallowed again. All of the training he'd gone through, both at school and at Sir's agency, and he felt helpless on how to handle this. Midoriya Kuin, I'm not angry. None of us are angry, we just want to understand what's going on. You know what's going on came the cracked voice from behind the door. Sir must have told you all about it. How I'm an evil villain who just wants to hurt all my friends and needs to be thrown into Tartarus as soon as possible before I taint Yui and my classmates any further. His voice cracked into a whine and a sob. Thick with self-loathing. His stomach flip-flopping, Mirio looked back at his friends. Nijire's brows were knotted together in horror, her gaze bouncing between Mirio and the bathroom door. Tamaki. Tamaki's shoulders were up around his ears and he was staring at the floor with the same horrified expression. This, this wasn't something that could be solved with a smile and a positive attitude. This wasn't something that could be solved by a multi-point plan either. 
This was someone locking themselves in a bathroom because they think that you're going to hurt them, and you have nothing to prove to them that they're wrong. In fact, the only reason they're in this situation is because you helped lure them into the situation that got them hurt in the first place. That was the part that hurt the most. The fact that Midoriya was right to be wary of him. He hadn't stepped in, at all, in fact. Even when he'd called All Might to tell him what was going on, he hadn't done anything in the situation to actually help. He just trusted that the adults and heroes would take care of it, and he could afford to sit on his hands. Well, now he was reaping the rewards of that stance. Ah, yes, that's what Sir told me was going on. He began slowly as he turned back to the door. But I don't think that that's what's actually going on. There was a sniffle behind the door. Th, then what do you think is, is going on? Mario licked his lips, sensing that he only had one chance at this before Midoriya completely shut down. I think, he said, thinking over his words carefully, that while you do have multiple quirks, there's more going on here than I know. And I think that regardless of how many you have, you do genuinely want to be a hero. There was a long silence, when there were only the sounds of Midoriya's shaky breathing filling the air. Then, more than anything, Midoriya said, his voice sounding broken as he opened the door just a crack. It's all I've ever wanted. And you will, Nijair said, stepping forward to stand beside Mario. But you can't if you lock yourself in the bathroom over this. Please talk to us. Midoriya's breathing was again the only noise in the room as the plea hung in the air. Through the crack, Mirio could see his kohai looking down at the ground as he thought. Just as the waiting began to verge on the unbearable, Tamaki spoke. Um, he mumbled. If it helps at all, you did mostly just use that other power to get to someone in trouble faster. I don't think that anyone would get mad at you for that, even if you weren't telling the truth about your powers in the first place. The door shut with a sharp click. Midoriya! Behind him, Mirio could feel the full body cringe that rippled through Tamaki. He wasn't able to turn around and comfort his friend though, because from behind that door he could hear the sound of someone sobbing. The world fell silent and dark as he activated his quirk, passing through the wall beside the door. Then he was in the bathroom, looking down at the curled-up figure of his kohai on the floor. Dropping to his own knees, Mirio recklessly reached out and touched Midoriya's shoulder in an attempt to comfort him. The way he flinched had him pulling back his hand though. No one would get mad? Midoriya choked out between sobs. I ate the quirk from a dead person. Despite the disturbing, almost hateful words, from the way he was curling in on himself this was not something that Midoriya was proud of. Every time. Every time he got back from a business trip he had a new quirk for me, and I didn't even think to question it. Even when I learned, I couldn't stop him. His voice cracked again, and he began sobbing. How can you not hate me? How can you not be mad? Mirio was hovering, unsure whether or not it was a good idea to touch Midoriya when the words clicked in his head. Suddenly, he felt very calm. Because you're not your father, Quirk or not. Midoriya looked up at him disbelievingly, only for Mirio to wrap his arms around him. You said it yourself? You didn't know. When you learned, you tried to stop him. And failed. Midoriya reminded him, but he didn't push him away. I couldn't stop him from taking people's quirks. If I even looked at someone's quirk for more than a second, he'd get it as a present to me, it didn't matter what I said but you still tried. Mirio injected as much solidity into his voice as he could. He was stating a fact, not something that could be argued with. You still tried, and tonight, you use your quirks to save people, not hurt them. Ingenium and his brother are alive because of you. You're the one that beat Stain. And you're the reason why we were there to do it. Mirio interrupted. He hugged him just a little tighter, wishing that he had his cape to wrap Midoriya up in and reassure him that Mirio was here for him. You're a good person, Midoriya Izuku, no matter who your father is, and you're going to be a fantastic hero. His shoulder felt wet, and his kohai's shoulders shook underneath his arms. You, you aren't going to tell on me? Tell everyone. No, never. Mirio promised, his stomach tightening at the thought. He knew that there were personal reasons behind Sir and Gran's viciousness, but if that was how people would usually react to Midoriya's secret he couldn't blame the other boy for keeping his mouth shut. But please, let me help you. Let Tamaki and Nijair help you. Nobody can do it all alone. He could now feel liquid streaking down shoulder blade, and Midoriya was hugging him back. He was sobbing silently, curled up and radiating the sort of pain that none of the training from Sir had taught Mirio how to soothe. Above them, the doorknob turned and the door swung open. Without Mirio having to say anything, Nijair and Tamaki were kneeling down beside him, 
surrounding Midoriya and holding him tightly as he let out some of the pain and fear that he'd been holding inside since the start of the internship week. He'd been so excited when Mirio had given him the invitation, smiling so widely it made Mirio's cheeks hurt in sympathy, and now the other boy shook and gasped, feeling like he could fall apart at any second in their arms, and Mirio could see now that for all that people said that he was the man closest to being the number one hero. He still had so much further to go. Well, he would start here and now, he promised himself. He would start his real climb to being a hero by saving the boy right in front of him. Midoriya Izuku, he promised himself, I will see you smile again. I see. Thank you, I will make my way down there immediately. Mirai tapped the end call button on his phone and placed it down on his desk, staring at it and biting the inside of his cheek. Mirio was safe, he told himself. Despite going out with Midoriya and ending up fighting Stain, something that had him wondering, the police officer had reassured him that he hadn't been harmed. There would still be a symbol of peace. What was that about? Mirai jumped a little and turned. From where he was lying on the couch, Gran Torino looked up at him balefully as he sat up. There was an emergency in Hosu, Mirai said. Several of those Numa creatures were released from a lab and Stain tried to strike again. Mirio, and he couldn't keep the pride from entering his voice, ended up taking Stain down as he tried to kill Ingenium and an intern. Gran grunted and reached for his cane, which was leaning against the couch. And Midoriya? A knock at the door interrupted them before Mirai could answer. Bubble Girl poked her head in without waiting for him to reply, looking nervous. Um, sir? There's someone here for you. Take a message, please, Mirai said. I'm going out soon. It's someone from Yui, Bubble Girl interrupted. A teacher. I? She hesitated, biting her lower lip. I don't think that he's going to take no for an answer. Mirai furrowed his brows. Why would a Yui teacher be here? Then someone cleared their throat, the noise almost sounding like a low growl. Bubble Girl yelped and stood up, her head disappearing. There was a low murmur, and then the door opened fully, revealing Bubble Girl, looking upset and... Mirai's breath caught in his throat, and from the couch he heard a soft intake of breath from Gran. He'd seen him in Yi's infirmary, but now... Skeletal, his sunken eyes looking like they were glowing in the dark pits of his eye sockets, and missing his trademark smile, all might towered over Mirai's sidekick radiating anger. Stepping into the room, he nodded briskly at Bubble Girl. Thank you, he rumbled, closing the door in her face. This won't take long. Mirai, thrown off by the lack of a smile, took a moment to speak. All might, he finally said. I wasn't expecting to see you so soon. May I assume that you're checking in on Mirio Quinn? It was a long shot, a little voice in the back of his head hissing that he should be looking for an exit, but he couldn't think of why else he'd be there. Unless. But no, there was no reason why he'd know. If he'd suspected anything he would have confronted Mirai earlier, surely. Tashinori. Gran's voice was gruff, and wary in a way that Mirai had never heard from the confident old man. You got something to say? All Might straightened, from where he'd been slightly bent over the doorknobs. His shoulders were stiff, Mirai noted. Shimura-sensei would be ashamed of you. Gran rocked back slightly like he'd just suffered a blow. What the hell are you saying, you brat? Mirio Kuin told me everything, All Might said, turning around, and his eyes burned like blue flames. Mirai's stomach flopped over itself, but he forced himself to rally. He was doing this for the man, even if he couldn't see it. I suppose I need to go over the meaning of a secret investigation with him again. The fire in All Might's eyes just became more intense at his words. An investigation? Is that what you call beating a child daily? Mirai felt his shoulders stiffen despite himself. It was a strategy. You know damned well that that's not true, Sasaki-san. All Might hissed. You ran most of my investigations into all for one. This investigation would be laughed out of any court in Japan. He stalked over to him, and despite his loss of muscle mass, Mirai found himself taking a step back as he loomed over him. This has nothing to do with actually investigating anything. It's only about you working out your fears of all for one on someone who can't fight back. Mirai gritted his teeth. How dare you? I am doing this to keep you safe. All Might scoffed. So that I might live too, maybe three more years before I die my pathetic death? The reminder of his vision was like a gut punch. That's unfair, Tashinori. Gran Torino spoke up for the first time since All Might had entered the room. For a moment, just a moment, Mirai saw All Might waver, a sight that was almost terrifying, 
before he straightened again and turned on his old teacher. Unfair? How is it unfair, when he brought it up every time we spoke until I did as he commanded and gave one for all to his chosen successor? About how I needed to give it up before I died so that the symbol of peace wouldn't crumble in public? So that Yagi Tashinori could go die in a secret hole somewhere, and you could stop putting up with him, and just bask in being the man behind two symbols of peace? He hadn't, Mirai hadn't. You've said yourself, Sasaki-san, your predictions are never wrong. All Might kept talking, like a charging bull slamming into an unlucky circus clown and trampling it. I'm going to die anyway. Pathetically. Your exact words. Since that's going to happen no matter what, there's no reason for you to torture an abused child for the sins of a villain he just happens to resemble. Abused? What did All Might mean? Looking over at Gran Torino, he saw the man pale and rock back on his heels at All Might's words. But then he visibly gathered himself and jutted out his chin. Don't act like we're looking forward to you dying, he snapped. We want to make sure that you get those years. Three years of life? Of just sitting around in a retirement home, waiting for death to find me? All Might clenched his fists. Sir, you were supposed to be retired years ago, and are still fighting. You've never made a sound about stopping. Why would you deny me that same right? Gran was silent, seemingly unable to look at his old student. But All Might didn't seem interested in sticking around and listening anymore. Reaching into his suit jacket, he pulled out a sheaf of papers. Here, he said curtly. Mirai swallowed and took them. What are these? The removal of your teaching license and the discharge papers of young Mirio's internship. All Might's gaze was pitiless. Young Mirio asked that I hand them in to you while I was here. He feels that he should no longer be learning from you. It was like an actual blow to the gut. Mirai gripped the paper so tightly that it wrinkled, trying to understand. What? He? I told you, he was the one that told me about what you were doing to young Midoriya. All Might smoothed his hands down the front of his oversized suit. And I'm very proud of him. You're right, he will make an amazing hero. I? Mirai couldn't breathe. Where will he even go? He has already set up another internship with Fat Gum for the rest of the year, All Might said. His friends seemed pleased by the idea. In any case, I need to go. Young Mirio called me from Hosu, he needs to be picked up. I already. Your teaching license was revoked, and he has stopped being your intern. You have no right to interfere with his career now. Turning, he strode over to the door. Don't worry, I'll also make sure that young Midoriya makes it home safely as well. The spite in that last sentence dried up Mirai's tongue, making him unable to say anything as All Might left. All he could do was stare at the door as it swung close with a slam that sounded as final as the door to a tomb being shut. Chapter 30 The sound of All for One's fingers slowly drumming against the polished surface of the table was the only noise in the empty restaurant. The king of the underworld was silent as he sat in the restaurant's chair, an ankle resting on the other leg's knee as he looked through the large floor-to-ceiling windows that lined the wall. The position allowed him an impressive view of the still smoldering city of Hosu and rescue efforts that were still racing through the streets. Even with the lights off, there was enough light from the fires and the emergency lights to allow the man to peruse the thick folder that lay on the table. Just a few inches away from it was a glass of the finest scotch that Kuro Jairi had been able to find, already emptied. Silently, Kuro Jairi bent over, pouring another few fingers of the alcohol over the remaining ice. He didn't say anything knowing that his opinion was either needed nor safe to express at this time. The Numu, all for one had been depending on them to form the core of his plans to bring Izuka back home. Losing them, to some low-life punk setting them free, in no doubt rankled the man, making him less forgiving towards his remaining allies' mistakes. Finally, the drumming stopped. All for one picked up the drink that Kuro Jairi had set down and took a large sip, the only sign other than the drumming fingers that he was upset. Smacking his lips, he let out a sigh. Well, he said, his voice slightly regretful like he was talking about dropping a cup of coffee. This is a setback. Kuro Jairi bit his lower lip beneath his mist. If his master was saying that, from anyone else, that was pretty much calling it a disaster. The attackers managed to destroy most of the cameras, master, but they did miss a few. He offered weakly, wary of attracting the anger that was no doubt boiling under the larger man's skin. It appears to have been. That Yakuza fanba overhaul. Yes, I read the report. There was a hint of bite behind the voice, warning Kyojiri to stay silent. The drumming began again. I should have killed him when I took little Erichan. 
all for one mused idly, still staring out the window. I don't suppose he was stupid enough to stay in his old base? Kuro Jairi swallowed. As far as we can tell so far, no master. A pity. That would have made putting that little wretch in his place that much easier. He sighed, sounding truly regretful. Picking up his glass, he took another sip, this one much smaller. In any case, fetch Tamra for me, if you wouldn't mind. I need to speak with him. Though all for one didn't turn his head to look, Kuro Jairi nodded. Opening a portal to the bar where he was waiting, the boy thankfully didn't need to be told to step through. Since Kuro Jairi had first received the news about the disaster going on in the city, and what was behind it, they had known that they would be being called on. After the fight with All Might, their master's forces had been decimated. They had already been losing me thanks to All Might's previous attacks on All for One's money-making establishments and deals, and like rats fleeing a sinking ship, many of All for One's more cowardly followers had tried to flee after seeing their god fall, lacking the faith that he would rise once more. Inko-chan taking so much money as she fled with young Izuka had further battered All for One's organization, leaving it on the knife's edge of collapsing completely. The Numu, previously a side project, had had their development fast-tracked so as to make up for their loss in manpower. All for one had quickly grown fond of them, though, and how they could be tailored to fit the jobs he had for them. Their inability to disobey or betray him also appealed to him. For a job such as retrieving his son, they were absolutely perfect. Without them, what were they going to do? Master always had a plan, though. Sensei, the white-haired boy said as soon as he stepped through, sinking down to kneel on the floor. I'm sorry. Don't apologize for things that you had no hand in, Tamura. All for one's voice was cool but not cold as he reprimanded the boy, his anger clearly not directed at him but at the circumstances. Kuro Jairi saw him flinch anyway. We have better things to focus on. The future, how we're going to be dealing with this sudden shortage of manpower, etc. His hand waved through the air lazily. Yes, sensei, Tamura said, not looking up from the floor. You want me to kill who did this? Just tell me their name. No. All for one's voice was bored and flat, dismissing the idea out of hand. No? Tamura asked, his head snapping up. No? echoed Kuro Jairi, the words slipping out against his will. No. All for one confirmed. Point one. We'll have to investigate to find the little brat's new hideout, something that you don't specialize in. Kuro Jairi winced. That was true. Shigaraki was more of a weapon that you pointed in the direction of an enemy not someone that you used to find an enemy. Point two. All for one continued. We still have a time crunch before our opportunity to get my son back appears. We need to replace the number that we just lost and unfortunately it is unlikely that we'll be able to create new ones in time. It was already pushing it with the ones we had. Kuro Jairi blinked. Was he saying what he thought he was saying? All for one turned his head in his chair just enough to make it clear that he was speaking directly to Shigaraki now. That means that we need to go on a recruitment drive. And since you, Tamura, will be the one leading them, that means that you should be the one heading it up. Looking over at the boy who was still kneeling on the floor, Kuro Jairi would have sworn that he wasn't breathing. As sensei. He sounded dazed, and Kuro Jairi wasn't surprised. For all that all for one had promised Shigaraki over the years, he hadn't been in the habit of actually trusting the boy with anything particularly important beyond kill this person and destroy that building slash object. For him to trust Shigaraki with recruiting the forces that no doubt would be involved in retrieving his son, it was an enormous show of trust and faith that Kuro Jairi couldn't help but wonder was truly warranted. Oh, no doubt Shigaraki would try, but he was not the most charismatic person around, certainly not next to all for one himself. T thank you, sensei! Shigaraki nearly prostrated himself on the floor, his voice thick with shock and adoration as he clearly realized what a show of trust this was. I won't fail you! Kuro Jairi squeezed the bottle he was holding until it hurt, too aware that that might not be a promise that his charge could keep. I know you won't, all for one said. Twisting his wrist, a file folder appeared out of thin air. He held it out towards him. And to get you started, I've taken the liberty of having this put together for you. Getting up from the floor, Shigaraki walked over and took the folder reverently. What is it, sensei? A list of possible recruits, all for one replied. A few names to get you started. Jiren was able to find them fairly quickly, but I have him digging for a few more that would be amenable to employment. Your job will be to convince them of the benefits for working for me. Shigaraki nodded seriously, 
in the way a little boy given a task by an adult would. Are there any you think should be approached first? Hmm, a few, all for one said, taking another sip of his drink. But I'll leave the actual decisions to you. All of them, however, have good reasons to despise hero society as it is right now, so it shouldn't be too hard to convince them to join up. Ah, a lesson. At least there would be some structure, Kuro Jairi tried to tell himself. Less than he would have expected, but he supposed that it made sense. If Shigaraki was to lead the retrieval team, then he would have to be able to deal with people. Look at the USJ, that had just been thrown together with the weight of all for one's name, and had been a disaster. Shigaraki opened the folder, quickly scanning through the contents. His eyes widened as he came to one particular page that Kuro Jairi couldn't read. Sensei, this is... Ah, you found it. All for one swirled his drink in its glass. That one would be especially open to our way of thinking, I believe. But he... Was abandoned and hurt by heroes, just like you were. All for one said. Approach him or don't approach him, it's your choice. In any case, I will leave you to it. He gestured at Kuro Jairi, a familiar one that Kuro Jairi immediately obeyed by opening a portal back to the bar. His voice lowered to a growl, and he stood up. In the meantime... I will be making sure that the little punk that made this necessary learns the error of his ways. You're certain? All Might sounded doubtful even as he clicked on the turn signal to turn down the small side street. Mirio nodded. It's no trouble. I'd feel bad letting him go to an empty apartment after tonight. The lies tasted bitter on his tongue. He and his friends had come up with their cover story when they had heard that All Might was coming to pick them up. They had managed to get Midoriya back into the hospital room's bed when the text had come in on Mirio's phone, sending them into a tizzy on what to say to the man. The confirmation of Midoriya's parentage, and then the number one hero of all people coming to pick them up and drive them home, in a car where they could have talked privately. The idea had been dismissed as soon as they saw the expression on Midoriya's face. He didn't know that it was All Might, just a teacher from Yui, but the utter terror had stopped the thought of encouraging the younger boy to come clean to an adult dead in its tracks. Even if that adult was all might, whispered a little voice in the back of Mirio's head. The man who had handed off the title of symbol of peace to him, who trusted him with one for all. Who only knew about him due to Sir's urging. The bitter taste in Mirio's mouth intensified. He didn't show any of his feelings on his face though. All might's burning blue eyes drifted in the rearview mirror until they landed on the hunched-over figure of Midoriya. Well, he said quietly, almost like he was talking to himself. I suppose not forcing you to stay home alone after being attacked by a serial killer is the least you can do. Slowing down to a stop, he put the car into park. All three of them got out of the car, heading towards the trunk. Opening it up, All Might reached in and pulled out Midoriya's bags, handing them to the boy. Once again, though, I wish to apologize on behalf of the school, All Might said. If you ever need to talk to someone, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I can definitely make sure that the other teachers know to take it easy on you. Midoriya had been silent ever since they had been picked up from the hospital. His tears dried up. Staring down at his feet, he took the bags with only a brief mumble thanks as Yagi trailed off, looking helpless. Mirio pressed his lips together tightly. Um, thank you, Yagi-san, he said, bowing to the other man. But we're both very tired. I think we'll just go to bed. I see. The worried crease in All Might's forehead didn't go away. Well, take care of him then, young man. I will. Mirio said, his voice rough. The inside of the house was quiet as they slipped through the door, Mirio pulling it shut and locking it behind them. Turning on the lights, he leaned against the wall and began to take his shoes off. It was a testament to how tired he was that it took a moment for him to notice that Midoriya hadn't joined him. He was just standing by the door, still hugging his bags to his chest and staring down at the floor. Ah, Mirio said. Are you okay, midoriya kun Should I? Is it really okay for me to be here? The rough rasp of the other boy's voice silenced Mirio. Midoriya shifted from one foot to the other nervously, not looking up. I I've caused you so much trouble, and you've lost your mentor now with his teaching license revoked. Oh. Mirio stood up with one shoe off and one shoe on. Gently, he placed his hand on top of his kohai's head, cutting off his nervous babble. Sir lost his license because of his own actions. He had a choice of how to treat you and he chose that. Mirio said, repeating out loud the words that had circled his head as he called All Might. I'm the one that called you. Your only crime was existing and that's no crime at all. Midoriya's shoulders hunched. Not a lot of people would agree with you. 
he said. My dad. Isn't you. And you aren't him. On an impulse, Mirio dropped his hand from his Kohai's head and pulled him into a tight hug. Sir made his choices, and your father made them too. Neither of them make our choices for us. There was a soft sniffle in his ear, and a sudden dampness on his shoulder. Midoriya was still holding his bags like they were a life preserver, but he didn't pull away from the embrace. Instead he stood there, trembling like a baby deer. For several minutes they stood like that, as Midoriya shook in his arms and struggled to get himself back under control. Mirio didn't comment on it, just rubbing his back. Finally, though, his kohai pulled away from him, scrubbing at his face. Sorry, he said. It's just, it's been a really long day. No problem, Mirio said, making sure to smile down at the smaller boy. Now come on, we should be going to sleep. You can use the shower first, I need to set out your bed anyways. Shouldn't we tell your dad? He's out of town visiting my grandpa, Mirio said, finishing getting his other shoe off. Even if he wasn't though, he'd be fine with you staying for a night. Stepping further into the house, he flicked on a light when a thought occurred to him. Or do you need to stay for longer? I could say that. And no, Midoriya said, towing off his shoes. Ah, I made some friends, they're letting me stay with them. Oh, I should introduce you to Kakin too, he knows everything too. The other boy was clearly rambling, not really paying attention to what was coming out of his mouth as he shuffled across the floor towards Mirio. I'll be fine, I can go to them tomorrow, they'll be fine with me coming back early. Sensing another crying jag coming, Mirio reached out and gently touched Midoriya's elbow. Hey, he said. It's okay. I was just asking because I was worried. I'm glad you have someone to stay with though. Midoriya's mouth snapped shut and he flinched. Sorry, he mumbled, biting his lower lip. Aye, I'll go take that bath now I think. Okay, Mirio replied, pulling his hand back. Okay. Towels are in the cabinet. It had been a very, very long night, and an even longer week. Mirio Senpai had been very nice, letting him stay over, but once Izuku had gotten started talking after the shower it had been impossible to stop. Only Mirio's insistence that they get some sleep had managed to slow the flow of words pouring from his mouth, and they had nearly missed their train regardless. Izuka hadn't thought that it was possible to be so happy to see his school, and yet, here he was, nearly weeping with relief as he walked onto Yui's grounds. Tipping his head back, he sniffled and tried not to let the tears fall. Nijaya Senpai had met him and Mirio Senpai on the train specifically to apply makeup for him, and he couldn't ruin her work so early in the day. Ah jeez, don't cry, Mirio Senpai said from beside him, reaching over to pat him on the back. It's all over. We're back at Yui. Everything's going to be all right. Oi, DKU? The sharp bark of Kakan's shout interrupted Mirio's words and Izuku's tears. Turning, Izuku opened his mouth to greet his friend only to have a phone shoved in his face. What the hell is this? Taking a step back so that his eyes could focus on what was on the phone screen, Izuku's tears dried as his heart sunk. There, on the front page of Asahi Shinbun, was his school photo, alongside the photos of the big three. And the headline. Japan's newest heroes rising. Yanking the phone out of Kakan's hands, he began to read. The article was all about the arrest of Stain, talking about how Mirio and his friends had taken him down, and how he had known what Stain's quirk was thanks to his brilliant young Kohai, who had figured it out just from a glance at some files during his work-study week. The article went on and on, praising the four of them for bringing the deranged serial killer to justice while the city was burning down around them. The mayor of Hosu was talking with Yui to give them all medals. There was a high-pitched noise ringing in Izuku's ears. As he reached the end of the article, he realized that it was coming from him. Yeah. What the hell, DKU? Kakan demanded. I take my eyes off of you for a few days and you're fighting a serial killer? People were turning to stare at them. Out of the corner of Izuku's eye, he could see that a few of them were starting to whisper and point. Kakan opened his mouth again to continue screaming only to find one of Mirio's muscular arms wrapping around his shoulders and lifting him off the ground. Hey, hey, Mirio said, his smile a little strained. People are staring, don't you know? Why don't we continue this somewhere more private? He didn't wait for an answer, already starting to drag the struggling Kakan away. Izuku, clutching the phone to his chest, scurried after them with his shoulders around his ears and the burning feeling of people's gazes on the back of his neck. The room Mirio pulled Kakin into was one of the smaller classrooms. Long counters were set up in rows, with stovetops and ovens built into them. A home economics classroom then, 
which explained why no one was in it. Mirio dropped Kaken as soon as Izuku was in, going over to close the door. Izuku just barely waited for it to click shut before the words started to bubble out from his mouth. You told them! Mirio turned away from the door with a serious expression that Izuku wasn't used to seeing on his senpai's face. I did. You did good work and deserve to be rewarded for it. But, his stomach was churning. Sure, he'd attracted attention during the entrance exam. Sure, he'd attracted attention during the sports festival. But seeing it written down, seeing his picture in the paper, seeing everyone praising him, they'd even interviewed Ingenium, who had praised him as well. It felt wrong. It felt scary. It made him feel like a fraud. I only saw those papers by chance, he said, dropping his gaze down to the floor. You and Nijire Senpai were the ones to do the real fighting. Now the teachers are going to look into me more. They would look into you anyways after Sir had his teaching license taken away. Mirio's words were blunt but not unkind, a fact that just barely managed to slip past the fear winding around his throat like a noose. An ingenium was already talking about you helping before I was interviewed. Desperate, Izuka looked back at the article. You couldn't have at least warned me? My mom, I told you my mom was taken, right? If someone looks closer or tries to interview her. He looked up, desperate for Mirio to understand his worry. The look of dawning horror on his face gave Izuka no relief. What does your mother do for a job? In his panic, Izuku had forgotten that Kaken was in the room too. He jumped, his friend's phone digging into his hand. What? Kaken's arms were crossed. You're worried about people digging. What does your mom do for a job? Maybe she's on a business trip. Or she doesn't want to talk to the press. It's not unusual for the family of heroes to refuse to speak to the press. Do you have access to an email account of hers? Or maybe you can make one and pretend it's hers. Izuka's brain needed a moment to clunk over and understand what Kaken was saying. Ah, you're saying that I should pretend to be her? Kaken shrugged. Probably would be the easiest way to turn suspicion away from yourself, he said bluntly. Reaching up, Izuka rubbed his forehead. Ah, I guess, he mumbled, even as he began to think back, trying to remember if his mum had ever shared her email password with him. A strong hand clapped down on his shoulder. It was Mirio. Your friend is right he said. Sir showed me how to spot a fake email address, so I can help you set one up that should pass an inspection if you need me to. Carefully, he steered Azuka towards the door. You should get to class and think it over, though, before the hallways fill up. His brain bubbling with information and ideas, Izuku didn't protest. Still clutching Kaken's phone to his chest, he tucked his chin to his chest and marched to the classroom, thinking furiously on how he was going to handle this new turn of events. Mirio closed the door behind Midoriya carefully before turning back to Bakugu. Midoriya's friend, and the only other person who knew the whole story, apparently. That was still a shitty move, just so you know, Bakugakun said. He'd been leaning against one of the long tables and now stood up straight, shoving his hands into his pockets. So, I'm assuming you're going to try and convince me to tell the teachers. The accusation, because it was an accusation, with that tone, made Mirio tense. He tried to smile forcing the roiling negativity that was tipping in his stomach down. You're a lively one, aren't you? But no, I'm not going to try and convince you to tell any of the teachers. Or the heroes. Bakugu raised an eyebrow at him and snorted softly. Really? I've heard you're pretty buddy-buddy with the teachers, coming in and out of their office. You sure you'll be able to keep your mouth shut? Well now Mirio was feeling a little insulted. I just got my mentor's teaching license taken away for assaulting Midoriyaku and so yes— I'm pretty sure that I'll be able to keep my mouth shut. He was snapping. Sir would have chided him for that. Mirio pushed that memory away. He'd been doing a good job of repressing things, but sometimes things bubbled up regardless. I was telling the truth, too. Midoriya-kun deserves the praise he's getting. He figured out Stain's quirk with just a glance at the victim's wounds and finding out the order of how he attacked. That's something that the professional analysts hadn't picked up on. Bakudu's nose wrinkled. Then praise him in private. Also, Ingenium had already mentioned it to the police. He was talking about how he should have been wearing his armored undersuit. They were looking more for corroboration than anything else when they asked me if Ingenium was telling the truth. Mirio crossed his arms. It was bound to get out. I just made sure that it was public, so that people know that he's a good person and a promising hero. To his credit, the other boy only needed a moment to understand what he was getting at. You think it's going to come out no matter what. I saw your marks. 
You came in second in the entrance exam. You have to know that there's no way Midoriya-kun will be able to keep this up for the rest of his life. It's going to come out, so I thought it would be good to build up as much goodwill as possible so that when it does, people will be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Bakuga finished, grimacing. Can you think of a better idea? It was Bakugu's turn to cross his arms over his chest. Maybe tell him that you told, instead of springing it on him with the article? Muriel raised an eyebrow. You're not telling me to tell him the plan? Bakuga scoffed. You saw how he reacted to just having his name better known. You think he'll react any better to having us point out that his plan is unsustainable? He shook his head, his brow deeply furrowed. No, we have to play the long con with him, just introduce bits and pieces of it slowly to him. Otherwise he'll panic and bolt, and change his name again or something. Mario grimaced. The younger boy wasn't wrong. That had been much of his own logic for not bringing it up earlier while Midoriya was staying over. But, wait. Change his name again? Bakuga drummed his fingers against his bicep and looked away. What did Deku tell you about me and him, exactly? Just that you were his friend and you were helping him cover up his secret. Mirio wondered at the expression on the other boy's face. A mixture of helplessness and guilt, with a hint of pleasure? Maybe at being called Midoriya's friend. We are. Were. Our moms met because they went to the same cafe with us when we were babies. Bakugu didn't look up. My mom was always curious about Enti because she was always surrounded by these huge bodyguards while carrying a little baby around, so when their orders got mixed up one day she decided to introduce herself and me to her. The guards didn't stop her because they were too busy yelling at the baristas. Mom always said that Enti was so shy talking to her she was kind of glad she had those bodyguards around to keep people from taking advantage of her. Bakugu's grimace deepened. She also said that she stopped thinking that when she finally met Enti's husband. Mirio echoed his grimace. Midoriya hadn't really talked about what it was like, growing up with all for one as a father besides his sobbing over being forced to take quirks, but already Mirio's stomach was flip-flopping from Bakuga's brief introduction to Midoriya's mother. Your mother met all for one. That got Bakuga's attention. His head snapped up. How do you know that name? He snarled. Mirio held up his hands. I'll explain afterwards, he said hurriedly. It has to do with why my mentor was abusing Midoriyakuin. Bakugu stared at him warily for a long couple of heartbeats. Then he finally continued. Yeah, of course we did. I used to go over to his place all the time for play dates. Big place. Usually just Deku and his mom. Apparently his dad traveled for business a lot. Mirio couldn't repress a shiver at what sort of business all for one could have been attending to on those visits. Bakuga smiled thinly at him. Yeah. I had a moment like that recently. The smile faded. But you should have seen them when the bastard was home. It was like everything outside of that house stopped existing. Everything they did revolved around him like he was some sort of god. Mum was surprised that he let Enti keep her maiden name with how controlling he was. Would have thought he'd want to stamp his ownership over her completely. Creep Mum right the fuck out. She always preferred to have them over than deal with him. He looked away again. Guess that's why she didn't complain when they started practically camping out at our place. Camping out. Staying over late, until those bodyguards started making noise about them having to get home. Started after Deku turned eight. They were doing it practically every night right up until they disappeared. Bakuga paused. Deku says that was when he found out about who his dad really was. Right after his birthday. His dad gave him a quirk that had belonged to one of Endeavor's sidekicks, and he realized where it was from when they pulled the poor fucker from the bay. The pity that Mirio felt for Midoriya deepened. That's horrible. Bakuga grunted. They disappeared about a year, year and a half after that. No warning. I thought I'd never see him again, and then I saw him here. Got him to finally tell me the truth. And here we are. Mirio didn't know what to say to that. What do you say to that? The warning bell to get to class rang, echoing through the halls. Bakuga grunted. We need to talk more, he said. Meet me back here after school. His tone brooked no disobedience. Uncrossing his arms and sticking his hands back into his pockets, he slouched towards the door. Mirio would hope so. There was so much he still didn't know about his kohai. He was realizing, things not covered by the boy's sobbing confession in the hospital bathroom. Things that he definitely wanted to dig into, had to dig into if he was going to help Midoriya make friends for when the truth inevitably came out. The truth. Wait, he called, just as Bakugu's hand was on the doorknob. 
You never answered my question. Eh? Bakuga looked over his shoulder, cocking a brow. Mario didn't flinch. You said that Midoriya isn't his real name. What is? Bakuga grunted. Shimura, he said, opening the door and letting the chatter of the school's students flow in. Shimura Izuka and Inko. And there you have it, Hero Squad, the epic conclusion to. What if Deku had all for one? It's been one heck of a ride, and I couldn't have asked for a better squad to share it with. Hit that subscribe button, leave your thoughts in the comments, and let's keep this hero revolution going strong. Massive thanks to Hwain for crafting this unforgettable adventure. Until next time, stay heroic, stay legendary, and this is Kronos signing off. Catch you in the next epic journey, heroes.